So uh, hi, everybody. As you're all joining up, um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes, and I'll give more of a overview at that point. Um, but we are going to, should be our last meeting, I think, of this group. But we'll have to talk a little bit about where we want, where we might want to see things go in the future. So um, as you're joining, if you wouldn't mind um, entering in your name, organization title in the chat box, that would be great. Just a reminder, I know you all know this at this point, but we do record these meetings and we make those recordings available. So if you want somebody to see the discussions later on, you can go to the Plan for Children website and you can find it there. Elise, do you want to um, screen share the agenda for me, please? Thanks. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, just so everybody knows, Tim is going to be able to join us late today. He has got something until 1030. So he will be joining us at 1030. But I see Jashonda is on um, on the call today. Um, so for the agenda today, we want to start by going through the family survey results, which were distributed after um, I believe after our last meeting, but um, I don't think anyone from this group has seen the results of those surveys. So we wanted to go through that. Um, and then after that, I uh, wanted to provide a, just an overview again of where we landed on our recommendations for this work group, given that this would, uh, is scheduled to be our last meeting and have a discussion around next steps. And Tim should be joining around that time so he can help lead and facilitate that conversation. And also we'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end for us to just to wrap up and talk about next steps. But for by and large, I think the goals that we set for this work group, which was a spinoff from the behavioral right. health urgent care work group have largely been achieved. So, um, so we'll kind of talk about next steps in that context. So let's, um, Elise, if you wouldn't mind also just pulling up the survey, thanks. I think one thing just right off the bat as this comes up, um, one thing that we were struck by when we looked at the results um, was how much alignment there was between the family perspective and, and the areas where we landed as a work group. So that's great news. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. We sent this out to networks of families and family advocacy organizations across the state, as well as members of the local community collaboratives and were, <clears throat> I think, at least I want to say within the first like 24 hours, we had like 40 responses. So we knew we were going to get a lot of activity. And ultimately, we ended up receiving 163 responses to the survey. And we focused it in a similar way, um, in a similar way to our conversation in this work group, but we kind of stripped away some of the jargon and inside baseball stuff that we talk about in the provider and advocacy or in this, in this kind of setting and focused around recommendations that you would offer for families as an alternative to seeking care in emergency room. And then the second question had to do with for you know, families that do end up in an emergency room with behavioral health need, what recommend, recommendations do you have to improve the system's ability to move those children out of the emergency department efficiently? And then we had a, a catch-all um, third question having to do with any other additional comments or recommendations that families had about um, the behavioral health issues in the state. Next slide. <clears throat> so on that first question, recommendations to uh, for families as an alternative to seeking care in an ED. And similar to this group, there was a heavy emphasis on the role of mobile crisis for diverting more kids from emergency department whenever possible. They also did talk about, and by the way, we co a, a lot of the information we got was qualitative. And so Elise took the lead role in coding that information and kind of identifying common themes. So mobile crisis was uh, identified by about 26% of our respondents for this question. 
a dedicated behavioral health facility. So kind of similar to what we've been talking about in our behavioral health urgent care work group um, came up for 15% of respondents. And then um, the role of increasing school-based services was um, a close third at 14%. And, and we looked in a little bit more detail at that response and found references to in-school therapy, social emotional learning, the role of school-based health centers and training school staff on behavioral health needs and trauma. So again, I see just see a lot of very similar patterns and responses and themes that we've identified and talked about in, in these groups as well. Uh, there was also 9% uh, of responses just kind of talked about a general need for an increase in service availability across the continuum of care. So just generally increasing access, increasing capacity for the system. And then lastly, for 8% of respondents, they talked about improving ED services within the ED. So increased bed availability, as well as staffing and expertise for behavioral health within the ED, space that's specifically dedicated for pediatric behavioral health, and then timeliness of the intake process once, um, once folks present to the ED. So let me just pause there. Any questions or thoughts or reflections on the results for question one? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So question two, again, we asked uh, when children and families present to an emergency department, what recommendations do you have for improving the system's ability to move the children out of the ED efficiently and into the next level of appropriate care? And this is, uh, for this item, the first, the most likely response or most frequent response had to do with improvements um, to the emergency departments. Now, Elise, actually, I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit more color to that. Um, if, if you could, if you have a sense of kind of what, in a little bit more detail, what people were referring to here. Sure, so it's actually um, kind of similar to what uh, was brought up in question um, one. So the recommendations included increasing staff, um, increasing- Hi, Garmin. Behavior health expertise. Hold on a second. Let me, let me uh, do can everybody go on mute, please? Thank you. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Um, increasing behavioral health expertise within the ED, um, creating a separate dedicated space for children with behavioral health needs, um, and improving the timeliness of assessments and triaging. Okay. So a lot of the same detail as question one. Exactly. Yep. The second, um, just over a quarter, 28% of respondents talked about referrals out of the emergency department as well as uh, availability of bridge services and a follow-up. So um, I think there was a sense among the families that there was a need for better timeliness of referrals while in the ED, um, the ability for, for them to walk out with an appointment before they leave the emergency department. Um, and then also the theme of uh, providing a warm transfer between the emergency department to a community-based provider. Um, that next sub bullet there talks about improving communication between emergency departments and community-based providers. I think, you know, again, consistent with that theme of ensuring that there's a good follow-up in place uh, for families when they're in the emergency department. Um, and then bridge services, including the role of mobile crisis and bridging young people as they're discharged from the ED to, to the community and uh, care, and also transparency in terms of bed availability for those youth that are being discharged from the ED to an inpatient hospitalization or waiting for an inpatient psychiatric bed. 27% of the respondents talked about increasing service availability across the continuum. So again, that's similar to what we saw on the responses to the first question. Um, but there was a little bit more detail here just around um, rural and high need areas. So making service, really focusing service availability around those areas where there are perceived gaps. And then finally, um, family engagement and parent focused services. So interaction between the emergency department and family members was raised as well as care coordination and peer support accessibility and opportunities for respite. <clears throat> Any questions or, or just comments about these results?
Great. Hopefully all you clinicians in the room are proud of me for remaining silent there for a good 12 seconds, waiting for, <laughs> waiting for someone to respond. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And if you want to interrupt me and you have some thoughts, please, by all means, just don't raise your hand or take yourself off mute. <clears throat> and then finally, um, we asked the sort of the final question around um, any, any last comments or recommendations that you have to improve the system and address this issue. And so we got sort of a lot of general and um, a lot of general responses, some specific responses as well increasing in services, which again, we saw in the last two slides. So that's definitely a theme. Uh, removing mask mandates came up for a fair number of people that responded. Services at EDs, which again, came up in some of the other questions. Improving interactions with children across the child serving workforce. Um, I'm not, at least I don't know if you have a sense of providing a little bit more color on that one, but it's a, that's also some that it's a little hard to wrap your hand, head around specifically what they're referring to here. Yeah, um, um, it really varied, but it generally was kind of uh, with the theme or flavor of, of just improving kind of the family friendliness of how, of, of actual interactions between staff and family. Um, um, you know, kind of the, either you know maybe the tone used or um or just engaging the family some there were you know some families ex or yeah families expressed um kind of feeling outside of the process that was going on between the child and clinician or or doctor amy um i see your note in the in the chat do you want to take yourself off mute let's see if we can get you on audio here Okay, so uh, just reading off uh, her comment in the chat box, appointments in mobile crisis from the ED have not gone well. So her, so she's saying, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure who or how that's being recommended. Um, anybody, I know there are several mobile crisis providers on the line, so anybody wanna speak to that one? In Sarah, is that you, Sarah Becker? I, I can. Um, you know, all I can say is that the mobile crisis providers, I think, have really tried to put ourselves out there um, to emergency departments in general, you know, and there's a lot of them. Um, offering, you know, just direct appointments right there. We'll show up multiple appointments a day. It's, I can think of maybe a few. Um, and then I'm not sure exactly what Amy was referring to. Um, and maybe she'll get back on but the deferred is so that the the part about children leaving the emergency department with an appointment. Um, those aren't always as fixed as we might want them to be. And an unfortunate consequence, I think, is that the intent is to link youth up with mobile crisis. I mean, that's terrific. But with the lack of coordination at the front end, more assessments are end up not being linked up with mobile crisis. So, or more families aren't being linked up. So it certainly increases a whole bunch of things, including re-referrals back to the emergency departments when the youth aren't attended to in the community. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. I signed off and signed back in. Um, sorry, so I missed what you're saying, Sarah, but I think essentially what's happening is the ED is trying to probably do a good practice, which is to say mobile crisis can see you tomorrow, you know, at two o'clock or, you know, 3.30, but, you know, we can't always guarantee that. And so if incoming mobiles come in, especially on a Saturday, you know, where multiple calls come in at the same time, you know, guaranteeing an appointment is a setup for, for us, at least in terms of how we're staffed currently. So if you want to give us extra money, I'll hire somebody who can just do that, you know, and take appointments. And that could be something we, you know, organize, um, like the way a clinic would organize appointments. But to send, 
or, or suggest in some way that a team that is always, you know, taking incoming crisis calls um, can also have scheduled appointments. They it conflicts, and families are disappointed when we don't when we say, okay, well, we can't do one thirty, but we could try to do two thirty or four o'clock, and they're sort of surprised by that. And so, you know, you can't schedule appointments with a mobile crisis team. It, it's just not how we function. Mm. Let me, let me just respond to that quick and then I'll go to Tammy. Um, just I, no question through all the work groups, I think the role that mobile crisis currently plays and, and proposed enhancements and increased funding to mobile crisis has been a very consistent theme and I totally get that. But what about the role of the facility liaison position within EDs? Because it does seem like that's supposed to be the mechanism for doing what you're talking about, Amy. Um, bit, like a yeah. dedicated staffing for for mobile crisis to be really kind of working very closely with the EDs. Yeah, so that came to us as a 0.5, you know, a half a FTE. And so at least for us, I have the clinical supervisor in that role of providing that collaboration. But, you know, we're mobile 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. and every weekend 1 to 10. So a Fair 0.5 isn't going to do it. You know? Okay. Yep. thank you. Uh, Tammy? Yeah, I just kind of want to agree. I mean, I'm not speaking from a particular place of, you know, direct experience. The village does not operate mobile crisis teams, but I do have this sense that mobile crisis actually does a really good job at what it's like built to do, right? It's a machine that's built to fulfill a purpose and it does that purpose. That purpose is responding to crisis calls. And I'm not even sure that this bridging function, which is so critical, um, is actually um, like is actually something that logistically or logically or even makes sense to tie to mobile crisis. It's like you're expecting a, something built for one function to fulfill another function. And it may be something that you actually have to tie more closely to this kind of urgent care concept um, or you know, to another part of the system instead of trying to kind of append it onto mobile crisis. Um, just kind of my musings on that. Thanks, Tammy. Gary? So for us, we have six hospitals in our region. Um, one that we actually go on site, five that do not permit us on site. Um, and I think this is a fair point. Um, remember that. So I, this is coming from families. I have, first of all, I'm really glad you all did this 130, 160 responses. This is great um, because this continues what we have seen for a decade when we ask families tell us what's on their mind. So this, they don't want to be caught in the middle of this. Um, they just want to know that there's stuff out there for them. And so I think that all of us that are providers have to own a piece of this in terms of the handoff from the hospital to the community, the community being available for EMPS. I totally get that, but there's, um, so, I, I, I'm, I'm, here, I'm hearing this discussion almost like in, of two minds. One is listening. I'm trying to hear the voice of families and they're saying, we don't care what the technical things are, or what you all are doing systemically. You should work, you should hear us and deal with it. On the other hand, I totally agree with my colleagues in saying that um, EMPS was designed for a specific purpose and uh, now we're at this point of credibility where everyone is asking for more stuff to happen. And so I would say same thing. We got a half a position across six hospitals. That's 24 hours a day. That's, it's not possible to do that. You do the best you can, but we're hearing from families saying this doesn't work for them. So we have to own that. And where it goes from now, of course, will be um, the credibility of all of us and the state officials as to whether or not you, you, you take this expert advice and also the family expert advice and actually do something with it or whether we ignore it or don't do something with it in which there's a consequence for that. Um, I certainly don't think we ask for this feedback from families to ignore it. So this is one I think we do have to wrestle with, but um, in the absence of there being resources, whether it's there's a different way in which we think about the bridge or there's new resources. My One of my frustrations with this is it fits with public hearing we did last week, which is, is that I'm not sure what's gonna happen from all of our effort because it's almost like people are ignoring what we're saying, which is, is that 
there's pieces of the system that are overwhelmed and understaffed and that there's too much of a demand on them. But what you can't do is you can't lay stuff on EMPS and then expect it to be mobile. So I would say, obviously, Jeff would know this, I mean, deferred calls and stuff like that, um, and, and even our protocol in our region, we place responding to hospital calls where kids are at a hospital emergency room beneath the community call if we only have one staff and two calls because you're talking about safety. So there's core things that are out there. But um, so I, anyway, of the two mind thing, we all have to hear, these are what families said, but on the other hand, as professionals, we also have to say, oh my gosh, um, we're being asked to do stuff that really we weren't designed to do. H how are we gonna do that and where are the resources gonna come from? And so I hope that that's the next step. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Sarah? Oh, I'm wondering if I'm on mute. Um, a couple of weeks back, and I, I know it's beyond the, the purview of the purpose of this meeting, but I think I had suggested like a work group just around the mobile crisis world and emergency departments because it really comes up in most of the conversations. And you can even hear here that we had three mobile crisis providers respond and we all had different takes on it, but we're trying to work with one you know, set of crises re regarding getting youth out of the emergency departments. But I, I think there's logistics. What are we all trying to do here? Is there some commonalities? There just may be some things we could do. If we do do that, I would um, hope that the hospitals also came to the table because there's some stuff there that ends up, as we can see, frustrating. Um, and it's not working for families. And it's also not always working for the youth or what we're trying to do with them, which is to you know, keep them uh, stable, linked, out of crisis, a whole bunch of things. So I, I guess that's uh, maybe just it. Um, my own perspective is I absolutely see mobile crisis as essential to the mobile response to our emergency departments and afterwards. I think it is a big part of why mobile crisis came into, you know, the purpose way, way back when in the 1990s did speak to this um, this this particular thing but that being said like there's some days we got you know like one we got seven calls back to back to back to back to back to see all these youth in 24 hours with virtually no coordination so that type of thing we i think we just need a lot more coordination to make sure it goes well sorry i got a little i have some passion around this one as many of us as do all right talk on. appreciate that sarah um, we'll go to carl next and then ann smith Thank you, and uh, good, uh, good morning. And uh, completely agree with, uh, with everything that's being said. And uh, obviously, EMPS, the existing services, both hospitals and the EMPS, are essential to getting us through this immediate crisis. And uh, Sarah, I know this is already happening probably all over the state, but uh, to my knowledge, EMS, EMPS providers <clears throat> and hospitals are meeting to talk about uh, how to address this immediate uh, crisis, you know, in, in our system. And, and so I think at least at one level, uh, encouraging those local meetings between the providers and the hospitals is essential to get us through this short-term crisis. Uh, I also think your idea of, uh, of having a, a more sort of collective uh, consideration of how these two existing providers work together to respond not only to crises, but also to improve normal uh, relations and operating procedures, I think is essential because it'll identify gaps in the system um, and uh, and figure out ways to address them. So that to me is a bit more of an intermediate step, but I think the, 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 the immediate step is to just get everybody together. I know, but nobody has time or people, but getting, getting the providers together to sort of work through this current crisis, I think is step one. And step two is the intermediate one. Thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm just looking at the chat box. Um, anything, Sherry? I, Sherry, I know you had a question about respite um, and kind of where that conversation may take place. And then, Jen, um, you may have had some thoughts about uh, the role that um, the Children's Center could play as a bridging service. And do you want to come off mute or? I just would like to know when we're going to have a conversation 
about Repta? I know we've mentioned it, but haven't really discussed it. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point and a good question. I think, um, I think we would agree the role respite doesn't really exist at this point, right? So the, this being the short-term solutions group, it's hard to imagine that we would be able to stand up respite programs on a short term, um, but it is, I think has come up and is relevant, I think within the behavioral health urgent care and crisis stabilization work group conversations kind of seems like where it fits. Again, not exactly the same thing, but it, I think that's where it fits most, most closely. Um, and I'm not sure if you've been attending those meetings or not. I'm doing a lot of these right now and losing track of which people are at which ones. I know many of you are at, at all of them. I've been attending too and waiting for it to come up and all the meetings are coming to an end. So that's why yeah. I'm Yeah. Um, Elise and I will, will make a note of that, talk it over with, with Tim and, and come up with some ideas about that. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Any other yeah. comments? Yep, sorry. You recognized me, but then did not call. Oh, I'm sorry. I th I think your hand went down, so I lost track of oh, it. Go you ahead. Had already me. I didn't I'm feel like I needed to leave it up. And, um, and that, um, go ahead, please. So on the one hand, I just want to say that I am very encouraged um, by what I'm hearing from some of the providers in terms of aligning with the concerns of family and, and particularly this comment around you've been hearing this from families for the last 10 years. Yes, um, 10 years and more. And, and what is of concern is that you know, we, even with this work group, ask for the family voice input when we were well into the work that we were doing. I just wanna encourage us to make sure that we change the way we do our policy setting and our recommendations to include family and youth at the outset because it can help us to avoid some of the systemic challenges that we see down the road. We make the decisions with the best of intention, but not fully informed by those who will be impacted by it. So encouraged, but at the same time, looking at have we really made progress and how can we make more progress addressing not only what is an immediate need, but the intermediate and long-term needs. We just need to be looking at how we do it differently. It's a very fair point and I appreciate the challenge. I really, I really do because I think we, it's good that we got this, but it's absolutely late. You're hundred percent right. Gary. Thank you, Ann. I I, I'd have to say for the public hearings that I participated in last week, I said that publicly I regretted that I was talking, but not having a family member with me. Um, and also would say that my experience has been in some ways that um, even if providers are accurate with this expert advice it's, or, or recommendations, it is not necessarily taken. But what hurts much more and that has always been um, very difficult for me to accept is when families say what they're saying here and they get ignored. So now these recommendations are very consistent with other things that the experts have recommended. That's great. But if it, it's one thing for the experts advice to be not considered, it's another thing for the voice of families to be ignored. So you're hearing the same things. So this is why for me, it's gonna be what's gonna happen. How is it going to be different? Or is it going to be that 10 years from now, maybe I'm still here and not retired. I'm going to be saying it's been 20 years and we haven't done what we needed to do. We're listening to families and we're not responding. So I, I hope that this is an action point. Um, but I would say uh, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. <laughs> but now it's irrefutable. The things that we're suggesting as experts align with core things that families are saying we owe and have an obligation to the families of this community that we care for to not only make sure that they're a voice at the table, but then to act when they say this is what they need. Thank you. I hope I'm not out of order, but I just want to respond to what Gavin has just said. And one thing that I think we can do is to start thinking about family and service 
recipient as expert. And let's try to get to this place where we're not dividing the expertise and level of respect for that expertise higher for providers than for those who receive those services. We've, we've got to get to a place where the family's voice is considered an expert voice as well. Because there is a saying, he who lives it knows it. So we may get training, our providers may be well-trained and underfunded, just thought I would stick that in there. However, the people who are living through it know how the policy and practice is impacting them. They are experts as well. Yep, absolutely. Well said. Okay, um, if there aren't any other further comments on this slide, let's, let's, I think the last are just um, some wrap up, um, some system implications actually from the family recommendation side. So uh, again, addressing services across the continuum was a common theme. The availability, uh, there must be sufficient availability and timely referrals available so that we don't create backlogs um, there's demand among family responses for alternatives to the ED for kids with behavioral health conditions, improved communications needed, um, families even noted workforce issues, staffing availability as well as expertise, and also recognition around two generational impacts. So children's, children are part of a family system and positive outcomes for children are really driven and interconnected with engagement of families throughout the system of care. And I know that's a, something that also frequently comes up in many of these discussions um, and can be particularly challenging in a state, you know, one of the few states in the country that have bifurcated children, children's mental health within one state agency and an adult in another that's fairly unique in the country and I think a specific challenge that exists for Connecticut. <clears throat> Next slide, please. That, that's actually the last slide. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Sarah, I know you, um, would you like to come off of mute and, and talk about that point? Sarah Egan. Yes, hi, hi, hi everybody. Yeah, thanks. my question was, um, where's the survey, right? My question is always like, where do we go with this information? And to Anne's point, you know, the, um, the family feedback is really important. And I know Gary was saying that as well. Um, so who's gonna, where's the survey going? Where's the report going? How is it going to be highlighted, that family input? And I guess my part two of that question, and I'm sure that's where you're going, Jeff, is where do we go from here? And how do we make these recommendations that you all facilitated, that everybody here gathered to work on over the last several weeks? How do we make them meaningful? How do we hold um, ourselves and uh, policymakers accountable for implementing these initiatives? At least, uh, would you would you mind sharing with uh, where the survey has gone at this point? I mean, we had to recall that we had the sh the work group um, survey and proceedings results report as well as this family survey result, and we can talk about where it's gone so far, and then transition into the that conversation, that important conversation about where do we go from here. Sure, my understanding is that um, Tim has shared it with the twelve commissioners and. Um, the tri-chairs and advisory board. Um, and then we did send it just yesterday. So we did send it to this work group. And if anyone did not receive it, please let me know. I'm happy to resend. Um, and I, my understanding is that's where it has been sent so far. Um, yes. And we will also follow up with the organizations, um, send it out today to the organizations who did send it to their families as well their family networks. Thanks, Elise. So let's let's hear from the group. Um, I want to know from you, you know, where where do we need to bring this information? We now have a over the last four weeks a good set of recommendations that came from all of you and 163 family members that responded. Where do you want us to talk about these results? Uh, Carl, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just as a corollary to Elisa's update, uh, and I know Elizabeth Kanata and Ann Smith are both uh, with me on this call, but in my capacity as one of the tri-chairs of the 
Children's Behavioral Health Plan Implementation Advisory Board. Uh, we have uh, scheduled a, uh, you know, a virtual meeting on Monday, December 6th uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., where I believe, and I'm prepared to be corrected by my fellow tri-chairs, that, you know, that we will be, you know, creating a forum specifically to address uh, not only these survey results, but the other survey results as well, and to focus, uh, you know, on this issue. Uh, we do know that uh, our meetings do attract uh, legislative interest. Uh, uh, the Children's Committee uh, administrators are generally helpful to us as we put these meetings together. And, uh, and I know we had at least, I think, nine uh, legislators uh, attend our most recent virtual meeting, which I felt was a a sign that uh, now is the time for action. Um, so thank you. Hey, Carl, before you go back on mute, could you, in addition to the nine legislators that um, came to the last meeting, and that was actually, um, I sit on that advisory board and that was the most legislators I've ever seen at that advisory board meeting, which was great. Um, but can you speak to the other participants around the table, just for those people on the work group who don't know um, about who sits on that group? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a statutorily mandated group. Uh, there are uh, upwards of 30 members. Uh, there are 12 uh, state agencies, uh, you know, uh, represented uh, in the group. Uh, there is substantial participation uh, by, the, uh, by the family voice. And I'll, I'll defer to Anne, you know, on that, but it's an array of agencies, providers, and uh, recipients uh, of services who who are you know who come together uh, at least quarterly to try to address the issue of establishing a system a true system approach uh, to children's behavioral health in, in Connecticut. Uh, one of the other unique aspects of this advisory board is it does include representatives of uh, commercial payers uh, as well as the government payers. So uh, I would posit, and this is my personal opinion, uh, that among all the groups that exist looking at this issue, that particular advisory board, I believe, may be among the broadest and, uh, and most inclusive in terms of trying to get uh, the constituents involved in the system around a table to talk about our mutual concerns and challenges. Elizabeth or Anne, anything to add? I'm sure I left something out. My esteemed colleague has actually touched on everything that I would have said. So you've done a great job with that, Carl. Um, the thing that I would again point out for us is that we want to make sure that identifying tables at which we share this information, that as much as possible when we're reporting out the results of this work group, that they are reported out together. So I would really be encouraging us to not be thinking that we've got two sets of recommendations, but that these are the recommendations that have come out of the work group and they comprise input from providers, families, et cetera. I think that that's a way to send a very important message. And if we don't do that, I think we're missing the boat. Great point. Um, and I can certainly do that. If we, if Elise or I have a role in, in talking about these findings, we will merge them together as, you know, one voice from um, everybody who contributed to the process. Sarah Egan. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is the, the heart of it, right? So I think it's I think it's really important for the Children's Behavioral Health Plan Implementation Advisory Board. Boy, we have to come up with some kind of anagram for that group because this is so much to say, right? Um, that's great that this is going to be the topic, and um, I think that's really important. I look at December 6th, and it just seems a long way off, right? Um, and I'm really, I think a lot of us are thinking about this lately, like what what are the levers for making these things happen? What is the function of these different tables? And I agree that that board has a lot of the right players, I, I, but I, it's not a governance body, right? It doesn't meet or function as a governance body. And um, I'm still pretty convinced, and I'm just being, you know, we're all colleagues and I'm just being really candid, that we do have a structural challenge here with our system. Um, and this group coming together as quickly as it did, and thanks to DCF and CHGI for facilitating that, 
the efficacy of this group is in some ways um, demonstrates to me is in some ways further evidence to me of a structural problem, right? Because this is an ad hoc group and coming together in the context of what? To deliver recommendations and we're, and we're sort, of, sort of being made up as it goes. You know, what I, what and not, I mean, I'm trying not to ramble here, but I mean, at some point I think we have to grapple with this structural, um, it, this, the, of how do we do this in a more structured way that has all the right players at the table with a designated role for developing recommendations, providing them to appropriators and policymakers, and having a framework of accountability for accomplishment and progress. And what are the data sets that we'll all have at our disposal for measuring access, um, capacity, access, efficacy, and outcomes to inform innovation and investment? Um, and I, I think we have a lot of good moving parts, but I do think it needs work to make it, to realize it. In the context of the immediate, immediate need, um, you know, there's, there's from a practical standpoint, there's only so many levers to push here, right? I'm not a mental, you all are experts. I am not an expert lawyer, right? I'm not a mental health provider. Um, I listen to all of you and I hear the same things over and over and over again. Um, and I'm doing my best to pass that message along. And the number one thing I hear outside of this structure issue we're talking about is resources. It will take resources to implement these recommendations. Um, and then as an advocate, I always wanna see an overlay of sort of data and accountability to make sure that the resources you know, are getting you know, what we want them to do. Um, and so there's only so many places the resources can come from. Well, before the legislative session, we're in a biennial year, so somebody has to make a decision to spend some money, right? There's only so many players that can do that with this. So somehow we have to get the key recommendations in a digestible format. Um, either OPM has to authorize a greater, and I don't, you know, they're probably experts on this call about the mechanics of authorizing further ARPA fund expenditures, but there's a lot of ARPA money. It didn't all get spent. And sounds like more needs to get allocated to implement some of these recommendations, whether it's expansion of mobile crisis or you know, some of the other things we wanna do on the acute care side. So to me, I, I, you know, I'm seeing the, you, know, you have one bucket of resources here at OPM. You have a legislature holding a forum next week on the speakers holding a forum. Um, so they can hopefully then communicate with, with each other about the need for these resources. Then we lead in in a couple months to a new legislative session. We're going to have to tackle some of the bigger picture resource issues around rates, reimbursement, contracting, and investments. Um, and we have to be ready with our recommendations. But so that's where I'm really focused is I don't, unless I'm missing it, I don't see another immediate option other than, um, and maybe others have thoughts about this, other than um, OPM and the legislature authorizing a further expenditure of ARPA funds for children's behavioral health. Am I, is there some other option? Because, because I don't know that DCF has the money allocated to itself, even for example, to invest in mobile crisis in the ways envisioned by these recommendations. So that, that's what I'm sort of throwing, that's a lot that I just threw out there, Jeff, sorry, but I um, just wanted to get the ball rolling. Thanks. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. And anybody who can kind of speak to that, that question of where the levers are and um, who, you know, who needs to be armed with this information and is in a position to be able to move resources in the ways that are being suggested here, I'd invite anybody who wants to speak to that. Um, right now, I see Tammy's hand up and then Sherry. I'm not going to speak to that specifically, although I, I tend to agree that there is a structural issue in terms of this planning, leadership, decision making and direction around children's behavioral health in the state. And I do think that it, it's absolutely true that the work of this work group is kind of exemplifies it, not to diminish it in any way, but um, is kind of a sign of the 
of the challenge that we have. Um, I really was actually just seeking kind of a point of clarification because we were kind of posing the question around timeline. And I know that there was a slide presentation that said that we would be seeing something in November. I know that at the legislative forum, we understood that something might be happening with this kind of urgent care in the spring. Um, and I now know that there is the implementation advisory committee meeting in December. So I just wondered, does like everyone have, uh, like does, who knows the answer to that question about next steps, right? Like who, 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 who could say definitively the answer to that? And that, I mean, therein lies the leadership question, right? Who knows? Well, uh, it's definitely not me. Um, but any, any, anybody who's on the line who, who can answer that, by all means, jump in. Let's go to Sherry first and then Ann. And Ann, keep your hand up so I don't forget. Hi, Jeff. Well, I'm sorry to hear you say so quickly that you would be involved because I do have to say you're an excellent facilitator. Um, posted in the comments that uh, I represent family for. Boy, I can't really hear you, Sherry. I don't know if others can. Sorry yeah, to jump in. A hard time. Can you hear me better? That's a little better. Right on. Um, I'm going to take my video off and hold my phone. See if that's any better. Um, I come to these meetings representing Family Forward Advocacy Connecticut, which is an organization advocating for families, parents. Um, the majority of whom are frequent flyers in everything we're talking about. And my family um, years ago brought me to this work. So I'm asking sort of in line with what we're talking about here, we need a steering committee, but also how just basics, how did this survey get distributed to families? I didn't receive it, nor did any of the families in my organization. So yes, we need a steering committee as to how, how we're stepping forward. How, we're, we're misstepping in the middle. So I, I see a steering committee and getting um, a lot of people to vote in on who's on that steering committee. So that's all, thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Um, Elise, do you wanna respond? Sure, yeah, I, yeah. First off, I apologize, I think we um, knew that in the kind of getting things out timely or quickly, um, we probably neglected and, and obviously did um, some important family groups. So, um, but just to directly answer in terms of who it was distributed to um, favor um, the network of care managers, the community collaboratives, CBAC members, and uh, um, AFCAMP and CFAC, those were the organizations that received um, the survey to send to their families. Um, and definitely need to think through kind of a, definitely a broader distribution for any future um, surveys. Thanks, Elise. Um, can you go to Ann? Well, let's go to Ann, please. Okay, I first have a disclaimer to Sarah's question, I may not have, I don't have answers. But what I would like to point out is that much of what has been brought up around um, the structural issues in which we are, these workers are trying to address specific um, concerns have been addressed in the Children's Behavioral Health Plan report to the Committee on Children that we submitted on the first week of October. And there were some specific recommendations in there around um, structural overhaul um, that could address some of the bifurcation, uh, replication, and um, lack of maximum collaboration um, between all of the different entities that touch the children's behavioral health system. I want to also point out that there was a recommendation around how the state needed to make sure it was maximizing the use of federal dollars, um, both to address the immediate need, but as well to be looking at the intermediate and long-term opportunities 
for us to strengthen um, our funding to the system. Um, and so for anyone who may not have taken a look at the report, it's not, it, it's not, a, it's not a very long report. And if you want to just take a look at the recommendation, I think you will find that, that, that the advisory board is really in tune with what are the real challenges behind the system um, and has some recommendations um, that could address that and at least begin to address that and take us in um, the right direction. And um, for those who might want to find it, it is posted on the Plan for Children website. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Jeff has already identified that um, in the chat. So um, I just wanted to really let people know that there is a forum that does exist that is looking at this issue on the structural level and has made some recommendations to address that. And I don't know if my fellow tri chairs want to follow up on that. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the muting and unmuting. I, so this is Elizabeth Kanata, also one of the tri chairs. I think that the the work groups with the the four work groups that have been underway with with the participants here is is a work group of the Children's Behavioral Health Plan Implementation Advisory Board, and and given that we have as much thoughtful feedback as we've had working in this quick time frame, I think the important thing is that we get these recommendations out and continue to direct towards these recommendations because there has been thoughtful input. I think I agree with all of the feedback about how we continue to collect feedback in the most coordinated way with families. But I think at this point with the crisis, we need to move with these recommendations and continue to move our system forward. Thanks, Elizabeth and Anne. Let's go back to Sarah Egan. Hi, everyone. Um, sort of pipe in because I found myself, I saw that I was shaking my head on the screen while Ann was talking, and it wasn't because I disagreed. It was, it was because um, it was because I just got a notification of another likely teen suicide that came in my email, um, unfortunately, as Ann was talking. And, and I thought I'd share that with this group because um, because that puts us at 11 for the year, which is the highest number I've, I've seen. Um, and the number, you know, I'm not saying that's a statistically significant increase, but it's painful to see that every day. And um, so I, I thought I'd share that <laughs> with all of you. Um, looks like a 16 year old. And I was looking at all this data yesterday for this NPR piece that they were doing on um, yesterday morning. And I was looking at the suicide data that we have for this year and last year. And, and I know that that's why part of why we're all here, right? But the numbers are just they're skewing up and the ages are skewing down, as you all know. And we've got two 11 year olds in the mix this year. They're both still likely suicides, not full suicides. Tim probably just got the same notification I got. Um, Boy, it's so jarring, Tim, when that comes in, right? I mean, well, we've got four kids between 11 and 14 this year. Um, and, um, and the other thing I talked about yesterday in NPR was the homicide numbers are up too, right? And we, we talk a lot about the ED utilization and boarding and, 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 and Alice really talked about this last week in the informational hearings. A lot of kids that don't come into the ED with suicidal behavior, but their mental health crisis is playing out in different ways. Our teen homicide numbers are, are way up, um, you know, from, from where I've ever seen them. We're at 14 homicides this year. They're not all teen homicides, but nine of them are. Um, and that's age um, 13 and up. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to um, clarify while I was shaking my head while Ann was talking and I thought I'd share that data with all of you. And we don't really talk about the youth homicides in this context, but, um, but we know that, that some of our kids are really, they don't always make it into our mental health system. 
And I think that that's part of what we need to be urgently also thinking about is that I'm, I'm not sure we've really addressed, um, not to throw a wrench into anything, but you know, what are the urgent recommendations that we can think of? And maybe it's worth coming together, Jeff, to think more about that for kids that um, may not show up in the ED, but um, who are in acute distress uh, in our communities. Um, and what are the urgent things we can do there on that front? So anyway, I, I offered that to all of you. I thought you'd be interested in that data. Well, as painful as it is, and we appreciate you bringing it into the discussion, it's important. And we need to be reminded why we're doing this work. Uh, this is certainly one of them. Tim, I, I see you've joined. We'll just kick it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I just got information that was really helpful to this group in this conversation specifically. But I do want to go briefly back. So I agree with you, Sarah, and we are all worried. I just also want to point out yet yeah, that they're not all completely confirmed. Um, a 20 year history shows that we have had uh, eight, an average of eight deaths annually. And if you look at that 20 year period, there's been two or three times that we hit uh, 10, 11 or 12. So again, it's hard to put it in context yet. That said, we are clearly worried that the next couple of years is going to be a tra trajectory upward and knock on wood so far, we've been able to um, keep it down around the same average. So we think we're doing better because all indications would be that they would be a significant increase. So, so um, we should continue to keep this in mind. Um, so I just got called on to the meeting for the meeting, which is now happening. So the meetings of the uh, incident command of the commissioners, uh, that meeting is going forward. And then there's now a meeting to report out on the progress of that meeting. So, um, so I just got uh, off of that meeting and um, the, the very poignant question that was asked just for directly to this group's exactly what's next steps regarding recommendations. So they asked, uh, the commissioners asked that we do a side-by-side -side, um, table of all the activities that are being funded with ARPA and all of the top recommendations that we have put forward. Um, I, I just caught the tail end of this issue of ongoing recommendations, which I want to say we need to support and endorse as we always do. However, I think one of the things that's been nice, if you look at a collective group of different sets of recommendations. There are some very common themes that are arising out of those. And I think it's really important for us to move forward. And what the, so, so the, um, once that is done, we present it back to the commissioners and say, these things are recommendations that have come forward from more than one source, this group being one, uh, Sarah, you've shared both the national AAP recommendations, you shared your recommendations, the parents' recommendations, uh, there's some stakeholder recommendations coming. So uh, there's some consistency in that and to make, to give the commissioners a direct suggestion that here's the things that are not going to be funded by current allocations for ARPA. Here's the priorities for the current. Could you go back to OPM and ask for funding for these items? And so that's exactly what was just told to me. So we will move on that, those lists and just put those things side by side. And just for um, clarification, I think that just having now been more on the inside of a lot of these things, there's still a lot of pieces that um, the state departments have been not um, completely uh, transparent about because they were trying to get things to uh, allow them to evolve to the point where um, uh, reporting out on them was, was a little bit more accurate about what state they were in. And there's been a lot of work to move more rapidly. Some of the stuff coming has been in, uh, in the works for some time um, and may fall short of some of the newest recommendations, but they began before these new recommendations occurred. So there's gotta be kind of, there's stuff that was in the pipeline that just has to be completed and, and brought out and help, but aren't is exactly the, the, the fullness of what some of the recommendations have been. So some of it may appear like, oh, this was a weak uh, attempt to answer uh, some recommendations, but that's really not the way it has, uh, it has occurred. But we'll, we'll talk those things out as they get um, uh, unfolded and reported out on. Um, so, so that's my biggest update for this group. So I thought that for us, this, that's a good windup of this group's work. And um, we have a place, we have motivation. Uh, I understand if I'm correct, I'm speaking out of, 
a little bit out of step line here because I'm an executive staff appointment, but there I understand there is money somewhere that has yet to be allocated. And I suspect that um, commissioners moving forward to OPM with a unified approach um, probably will will have some attention exactly what gets funded and what doesn't ultimately is will, will be decided uh, again by somebody there. So uh, so that's my update. Any quick questions? I know we've got a minute left. All right. So I want to just uh, take the moment to. Uh, uh, so Sarah, quick question. Sorry, he like raised my hand because I couldn't find it fast. Um, so I think that sounds great, Tim. I think that's what we were talking about before you came on, that we have to go back to that ARPA pool and see what else needs to get funded. Um, so I, I, I was good to hear that. Are there other initiatives that you can share with this group that are underway? I know you're, you're doing that work on the executive side um, that, that folks have been meeting now for a few weeks concurrent to this meeting. Is there... Is there anything else that you can share that that group has been working on as it anticipated recommendations from this group? Uh, I, I, th I think I'm in a situation where there's a meeting next Tuesday where the commissioners are gonna share more fully what, the, what things are in progress. I, I'm not sure I'm in a position to chump that meeting. So, <laughs> and that was some of the conversation of the last uh, um, meeting, to be honest. So. Um, so anyway, again, lots of information will be coming forward. Again, it may appear, we'll just let it come and then we can talk about that um, in the, the uh, next phase of this group, which will go back to the group for the urgent care crisis stabilization work. And um, I just wanted to take a moment and just acknowledge everybody pivoting rapidly for this. Appreciate um, everybody's uh, joining on this and, and just wanna kind of call out uh, the partnership here in particular, kind of the hospital association and the ED group, and then the community provider group. And I just think that we need to do a better job of direct communication um, and continue to work through areas that we don't always uh, kind of understand with each other and, and work through that. So I, I felt like this process has been good to help build some of those bridges and make some of those connections. So again, I continue to put forth a, a stronger partnership and collaboration and, and deeper appreciation and support for each other's roles in the system. And as I've said, in a number of situations, we all need each other. So I really do appreciate everybody's work on this. So really, thank you very much. Yeah, just echo echoing that for all the Ted Lasso fans out there, appreciate you <laughs> watching that show. Uh, but yeah, we, we really do need everybody to weigh in and uh, I would really, it was really pretty, pretty great to see this group come together so quickly. So thank you uh, to everyone for lending your time and your expertise to this process. And it does not end here. Uh, we have other work groups that are also wrapping up, but it's not going to end there either. So um, stay tuned for more. Thanks, everyone. Great. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.